what tonight will tell us is something about the commitment of Robin Walker mm. um, to this path that he has chosen to educate us to our greatness, to our glory, to our history. Um, Robin Walker is the author of this seminal publication, When We Ruled, which covers over 90,000 years of African achievement that can be verified visibly. You can go to the continent, you can see it. He's got the context, he's got the analysis, he's got the footnotes. Um, he has a range of other books. He teaches black studies courses in England, um, throughout England. He's one of, one of the most well-known lecturers in England. Um, and this is his first trip to the States. Um, and just to say that um, this is a man who's going to be here for the long run, for the long run. So um, we hope that you remember this evening and you'll be in a position to tell your grandchildren about it. So with that, I will introduce our brother, Robin Walker. Well, greetings. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I understand. Well, what I'm going to do is talk about my book, When We Ruled, and I'm going to speak for about one hour or less. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of images, so all you need to do is just look at the screen, look at the images, and just hear me talk about it. Alright, let's get into it. I'm also known as the Black History Man, because that's what I do, I teach Black History. And my proudest achievement is when I met the Prime Minister of Jamaica in the year 2007. And I don't know if you can see that I'm passing her an object, and that object, you can see that object on her lap, and that object happens to be the book, When We Ruled. So the ambition then is to get this to as many different African heads of state, as many different Caribbean heads of state, and could it possibly even get to Obama? Big mm. question. All right, in 1851, a German scholar visited Africa and drew this. And this is what I call the stereotypical African scene. Jungles, swamps, wild animals. In other words, a land without history. Now, when Africa is dismissed as a land without history, the standard response from black people is, of course we have a history. We used to be slaves. And during the time of this great woman, Queen Elizabeth I, large numbers of black people were captured and rounded up as slaves. The person that did it was Sir John Hawkins, 1562. This is his crest. So that raises another question, and that question is this. What history do black people have before 1562? Do you think that's a good question? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that's a relevant question. Well, this is some of the history we have. The Songhai Empire, at its height, ruled two-thirds of West Africa. On a modern map, this bit here would be Senegal and Gambia. That would be Guinea, that would be Mauritania, this would be Mali, this would be Niger, and this would be Nigeria. It was built on two waterways, the River Niger and the Senegal River. There were great cities such as Gao, the political capital, Timbuktu, the cultural capital. Jene was a great city and Kano was a great city. The Songhai Empire was about writing. And here we have a Songhai king's tombstone. Now why this is important is most of us have been led to believe that Africa didn't have any writing. So here we have it. The king's name is Abu Bekr ibn Abi Kuhafa. He died in the year 1110 AD. How do we know this? Because that's what's on the inscription. So here we have proof of writing. So what was a typical Songhai city like? Think that's a good question? The city of Timbuktu exists, present tense. Many people were led to believe that Timbuktu is a mythical city just like Atlantis. Here we've got an aerial photograph of the medieval part of the city. Its population was 115,000, which is five and a half times bigger 
the medieval London's population of 20,000. Mm -hmm. There were 25,000 people at university, there were 30,000 people at school. So, how did this city survive? It survived because of trade. There were camel caravans, especially in the north, bringing goods into Timbuktu. There were donkey caravans, especially in the south, bringing goods into Timbuktu. Goods also moved by barge. There were barges that could carry between 3 and 50 people, called almadias, and there were larger barges called um, canters that could carry up to 80 people. And goods moved along the two waterways. Now, what were these goods? Gold was the most important. Now, are we feeling this example of early West African gold? Are we feeling this? Yes. All right. okay. Another one is salt. This salt cellar, made of ivory, was made between 1490 and 1530 AD, during the Songhai period, and that is the kind of salt cellars that we used to make. It's about this high, and there are 800 of these examples dotted throughout the European Museum's collections. A third product was leather. Again, this is taken from the British Museum. These ostrich feather sandals uh, were from Kano in northern Nigeria. I pointed out where Kano was on the map. That was a part of the Songhai Empire. And we were wearing sandals like this. We were wearing boots like this. Now this is important because this challenges stereotypes. You see, most people are under the impression that Africans didn't wear shoes, it was all about barefoot. Here we've got the sandals, and I'm going to show you a close-up where we see contrasting colours of leather stitched together, worked in a very regular way. I believe this is modern industrial standards. Now I've mentioned the gold, I've mentioned the salt, I've mentioned the leather, but the biggest product in 16th century West Africa was, of course, books. Here we have an account by a Moroccan visitor called Leo Africanus who says, in Timbuktu there are numerous judges, doctors and clerics, all receiving good salaries from the king. He paid great respect to men of learning. There is a big demand for books in manuscript imported from North Africa. <coughs> More profit is made from the book trade than from any other line of business. Meaning that books made more than gold, books made more than salt, okay. books made more than leather, and so books were the biggest product. Now here's the thing, these books still exist. There are 3,450 handwritten books that are still held by black families and institutions in the African cities of Chingeti and Wadan. There are 6,000 books that still exist in the West African city of Walata, and there are, wait for it, 700,000 manuscripts that still exist in Timbuktu. So what's in these <coughs> manuscripts? Here we've got a 15th century manuscript owned by Mohammed Habert, who was the Imam of Chingeti. And can you see his hand is pointing at his ancestor's handiwork, and this is clearly the lunar cycle, the cycle of the moon, and the various shadows coming off the cycle of the moon, showing the kind of scientific endeavor that we were dealing with in Songhai times and earlier. With these multiple sources of wealth, gold, silver, excuse me, gold, leather, books, and salt, notions of <coughs> bling existed. This is a modern photograph of Nana Uwusu Sampa III, and you can see that he's blinging, he's blinging, even Puff Daddy can't compete with that. <laughs> but in 1375, this map was drawn, and you can see the West African king is shown with his golden crown, his orb of gold, and his wand of gold. This West African king's name is Mansa Musa I. Now this is what the press are saying about this king. There's a British newspaper called the Daily Express, and it says, Revealed, the richest person ever. The richest person there's ever been in human history. 
And then they've got the list. Number one, Mansa Musa the first, 249 billion pounds. Number two, the Rothschilds dynasty. Showing that Mansa Musa the first was wealthier than the Rothschilds. Now, 249 billion pounds in dollars, that is 400 billion US. So there's our first fact. You can say that you came to a Robin Walker session and you've learned that Africa in the 14th century produced the richest man in history. So that raises questions. The obvious question is, well, what did they do with the money? They built monuments. Here we've got the same article, a uh, different newspaper. Meet the 14th century African king who was richest man in the world of all time. Okay, so they built this. This is the great mosque of Jene. Now, can you see it's a little bit impressive? Think it's a little bit impressive? Mm -hmm. And it's still there. It's a modern aerial photograph. That was originally built in the 11th century, which means it was built 1000 and something. It was converted into a mosque in the year 1204. It's been built, rebuilt, built, rebuilt, but it's still there. And you can also see the medieval houses that are also still there, dotted around it from the city of Jenne. Now what's important about this mosque is this. We've got here the three grand towers, and then we've got some people in the picture. Now can you see these people are ants compared to this? So here's our second fact that we can come away with. The Great Mosque of Jenne is the largest example of what's called the Sudanese style of architecture. The largest clay brick building on earth. This is the same size as three football pitches. Are we getting this? And there's inside the uh, columned part where we've got the 99 columns ending in these pointed arches. The other public buildings were equally large and equally impressive, and they're also still here. This is the Great Mosque of Sand. Then we have some palaces that are still around. This is the Royal Palace of Daura. And when we go through this gateway, we've then got other buildings. We go through that, more buildings. That was established in the 15th century, 1400 and something. And again, it is still here. So what was a typical townhouse like? The townhouses in Jenne were of two storeys. And these two storey houses on the upper floor used to have indoor toilets. And the significance of that is this. If you were in 16th century London and you went past someone's open window, it was the standard practice to throw the waste material outside of the open window and if people were walking by it would end up landing on them. Here we had indoor toilets. Okay, there were other civilizations in West Africa. We're going to look at, this is the Nigeria region on the map, we're going to look at the Yorubas ruling from this place here, Ile Ife, we're going to look at the Igbos and we're going to look at this place here called Nok. Okay, let's look at it. This is one of the fabulous pieces of fine art from the Yoruba civilization. This art piece was made somewhere around 1200, some say 1300 AD, and it's made of metal. And these uh, Yoruba rulers, they took the title Oni. And this one, I believe, is Oni Olowo, a female ruler. And this is her portrait sculpture made something like 1200, 1300 AD. Here we see an Oni in full ceremonial regalia, including the staff, the rosette, and the, um, the insignia of royalty, the tassels, and so on. This is every bit as good as anything the ancient Greeks ever came up with, every bit as good as anything the Romans ever came up with. This is every bit as good as anything created during the European Renaissance period. Now this is what the Daily Telegraph says about seeing that art. They said, Kingdom of Ife, the British Museum Review. The quality of the West African sculpture in the British Museum's show is flabbergasting. That meant that the Daily Telegraph's reviewer was so shocked he didn't know what to say. And so there's our second fact. You can say you came to a Robin Walker session. 
and you've learned something. Yoruba metal art is amongst the finest in the world. Now archaeologists in 1938 dug up these artifacts from Iboland. They dated them to 800 to 1000 AD, which means that they're 1000 to 1200 years old. And they are made of four different metals worked together. Now can you see this is a drinking uh, vessel in the shape of a seashell, made of metal 1000 to 1200 years ago. Here's another one of those Ebo artifacts made from the same period. Everything that you're seeing, including the cage, including the reef knots, was made between 1,000 and 1,200 years ago. Archaeologists in 1928 discovered an even earlier civilization called the Nock civilization. And this is one of 400 pieces of Nock art. Now, can you see that the eyes are diamond shaped, the mouth is diamond shaped? And so when we take body shapes and turn them into geometric shapes, this is called modernism in art. Yet these sculptures were made between 3,000 years ago and 2,300 years ago. So Africans were dealing with modernism, something like 2,600 years before Pablo Picasso and Modigliani. Are we understanding this? Are we understanding the importance of this? Change. Right? Change. Okay, now, I've shown you some of what West Africa was saying. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to show you some of what East Africa was saying. The Swahili civilization existed all the way along the East African coast from Somalia down through Kenya, down through Tanzania, down to, to Mozambique. And the Swahili civilization, contrary to what a lot of people claim, was a black civilization. It was not an Arab civilization. Now the Swahilis existed between 700 AD and 1505 AD. And there were great cities like Mogadishu in Somalia, like Malindi in Kenya, like Kilwa, in Tanzania and Zanzibar in Tanzania. All right, now this is a typical medieval East African front door. You feeling that? Yeah, I'm feeling that. Now, there's front doors like this in Asia, and that raised the question did we get it from them or did they get it from us? And that question has gone backwards and forwards. Now, the reason why scholars can't answer definitively is that there were shipping from Asia sailing to Africa bringing ideas. Does that make sense? But there were also African ships such as these sailing east also bringing ideas. And these African ships were called Dua La Ntepes. And these have been around for 2,000 years sailing on the high seas, sailing as far as India and China. Now, what do we know? We know that they were trading steel. And this is a cross section of an East African steel smelter. And these steel smelters show what we were doing between 500 AD all the way up to the end of the 19th century. We were doing steel and our ships were bringing those steel artifacts to India as far as China. Not only that, we had money. We were dealing with currency. And these coins go back about a thousand years, and they've got uh, writing on them and so on. But here's the shocker about the coins. British newspaper says, how 900-year-old African coins found in Australia may finally solve the mystery of who arrived down under first. Are we feeling this? I'll just let this one sink in. Right, that's sunking. Right, good, we can move it on. So what do we know about these East African cities? They used to build the graveyards first. And that is an East African burial 
I'm proud to say I took that photograph. Mm -hmm. And this woman here is what the scholars would call a native. And it was her ancestors that built that. Now, can you see that it's a very fine burial? It looks like a little house. And these are made of coral stone. And because of these burial tombs, we know that there are 50 sets of them. And because the ancestors, the preserve of the ancestors, were built first, if you've got 50 of these, 50 sets of these, then you can work out there must have been 50 cities all the way along the East African coast. So, what did these cities look like? The city of Mogadishu in Somalia still exists. Now, can you see that we've got three and four story buildings there? Are we feeling that? Okay. Now, can you see that that explodes just about every anti African stereotype that you could possibly imagine? Yes? Mm -hmm. Just focus on that. That is still there. That is a modern photograph of the medieval part of our Mogadishu. Right, so consequently, right. So we've got some proper black Africans here. So no one can't come with no Arab nothing. Here we've got the document. Then it says, they have cuttings on their faces like those of the Limian of Janada, West Africa. Kilwa is one of the most beautiful and well-constructed cities in the world. The whole of it is elegantly built. <coughs> So here we have then our third fact. You came to a Robin Walker session. You've learned that the Tanzanian city of Kilwa was considered one of the most beautiful and well-constructed cities in the world. So let's take a look. Think it's worth taking a look? This is the largest public monument of Kilwa. And it's in ruins. But this was originally built in the 10th century, which means 900 and something AD. And then it was enlarged in the 15th century, 1400 and something AD. Now, can you see that the building starts here and ends here? And can we see that we've got domes and what appears to be a barrel lying on its side? Domes and then a barrel lying on its side. Made of concrete, this is exceptionally difficult to build. All right, let me give you a side view. Are we feeling that? Mm. This monument is called the Great Mosque of Kilwa. Now, if we go inside, this is what's there. Are we feeling that? Mm, wow. Not exactly jungle savagery, is it? Nope. Yeah? Okay, what else do we know? This is a palace. Again, I took this photograph. And when I was there, the palace is called the Palace of Gedi, which is in Ta um, Kenya. I counted 54 rooms, or the ruins are 54 rooms. I counted 11 courtyards. I counted six uh, cubicle toilets, the ruins of, and I counted seven burial areas. Now, some people are wondering, toilets? Right, this is uh, a tourist guide. The site that I'm talking about is Gedi. See that? Does that make sense? Now, I know you can't see it, so I'm going to blow it up. Let's blow it up. Can you see here? Gedi. This is it blown up. The buildings were constructed of coral rag, coral lime and earth, and some have pictures incised into the plaster finish of their walls. Though many of these have deteriorated in recent years. The toilet facilities in the houses are particularly impressive, generally in a double cubicle style with a squat toilet in one and a washstand in the other where a bowl would have been used. Are we feeling this? Yeah? Aren't you glad you came to this session? <laughs> okay. Um, a number of, come in one minute, a number of uh, 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 disused mansions also exist on the coast of Kenya at a site called Lamu. And this is one of those disused mansions. Are we feeling that? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, just, you, you've been talking about bathrooms being used in Africa toilets. That's right. Now, what century are we in? Well, these. Yeah, but what 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 year what date are we at? Okay, these ones are you know um the the what the palace. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was 13th century, 13th century, 1200 and something. Yes. yes are we sir. feeling this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, now we've looked at some of what was going on in early West Africa. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the book's got a lot more than this, but since I'm talking now, I'm going to keep it short. We've looked at some of what was going on in early East Africa. Again, we've had to keep it short. Now I'm going to show you some of what was going on in ancient Africa. Does that make sense? Okay. And you like that photo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my friends took that one. And then he goes on to say, clues to oldest monarchy found in Nubia. Now what does the term monarchy mean? Kings. The first kingdom on earth. So you can say that you came to our session here in this shop. We learned something. The ancient kingdom of Nubia is the world's first government. And then we blow it up a little bit. Then it says here, a detailed monograph on the discoveries is in preparation, but there is no deadline and publication is expected to be a few years away. The following year, the article came out, The Lost Pharaohs of Nubia, showing that a dynasty of Nubian pharaohs ruled as the first kings on earth. Are you understanding this? And this there is now, now the beginnings of world history, right here. Then world history moves from Nubia to Egypt, and we get this. This is Pharaoh Mena. Some people call him Menes, some people call him Nameh. The first king of the first dynasty of ancient Egypt. And can you see he's also the ancestor of Mr. Michael Tyson? I'll just let that one see again. That look like Mike Tyson to you? There it is. Right, so, dynasty one. Here we see some ancient Egyptian hair. Now, can you see those dreadlocks? Right, so this is important in establishing that the ancient Egyptians used to be black people. The modern Egyptians are not black people, so we have to make that distinction. The ancient Egyptians. Okay, so what do we know about ancient Egypt? The timeline is controversial. Different scholars are not sure how old ancient Egypt is. Dynasty. Now people are wondering, what's a dynasty? It's a line of kings belonging to the same family. Yes? And can you see then that Zosa's family, well, if that's what he looks like, you can work out what the rest of his family look like. Yes? So he's third ruling dynasty. Pharaoh Khufu belonged to the fourth ruling dynasty. Pharaoh Sahura belonged to the fifth ruling dynasty. Pharaoh Pepi belonged to the sixth ruling dynasty. Now, the total amount of kings in dynasty 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is 50 kings. And they rule for a long period of time, 1,472 years. But can you see that they're Africans? So what did the Egyptians achieve when they were Africans? This is what the Egyptians achieved. They built that. Yes? Okay. Now, here's the thing. Can you see that person right there? <laughs> yes? No. Okay. Right, so let that focus in on that, yes? So here's our fifth fact. Our fifth fact today is we've learned that Pharaoh Khufu is the greatest architect in history, yes? Nothing's been built like that since, yeah? All right, after this, we get another good period of Egypt called the Middle Kingdom, which is dynasties 11 and 12. The first king of the Middle Kingdom is this guy here, Mentuhotep II. Then Egypt goes into decline again. Then we get a next period called the New Kingdom period, dynasties 18, 19, and 20. The founder of this period is this woman here, Amos Nefertari, this man here, Amos, their husband and wife. Yes? And they are the first rulers of the New Kingdom period. So again, Egypt stayed African. So what did the Egyptians achieve during this period? They built this. This is called Karnak. Now can you see it's a little bit impressive? Just a little bit, yes? Are you feeling this? So this is what the Egyptians built. Now, when we go inside this temple, we're going to see something that's a bit of a surprise. When we go inside this temple, this is what we see. Right, does anyone know what this is? 
this yellow building, it's a mosque. And you may wonder, what's a mosque doing there? Well, this is what happened. The people of Egypt were conquered and colonized by the people from Arabia, Arabs. And those people, they didn't just conquer Egypt, they conquered Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and they're still there. They rule North Africa. So that's the reason why the modern people of Egypt are black. Had this not happened, black people would still be in Egypt as the, as the biggest population. You get it? Yeah? Yes, sir. And then once the Arabs conquered, in the year 639 AD, they built that to show that we now run this country. And they built it in the middle of an African temple as a way of making it clear, we now run things. Yeah, I was going to say that that looks much newer. That's right, that's right, that's right. Whatever that's right. They, material they use. That's right. Okay, now, let me explain some things. Most Egyptian art looks like this. And because most Egyptian art looks like this, and those colors don't look very African, this is why a lot of people are confused about whether or not the Egyptians were Africans. Does that make sense? Because these colors look too light to be African. Now what's really going on here is a color scheme. Men in Egyptian art are usually shown the color red. Women in Egyptian art are usually shown the color yellow. It doesn't mean they really were red and yellow. Does that make sense? How do we know that it doesn't mean that? Here we've got someone shown as yellow and someone shown as turquoise. Because we know that turquoise people do not exist, that's why we know the colors are not real. Does that make sense? Because if the colors were real, we're going to have to explain turquoise people. Does that make sense? Yeah? This is the kind of art that Egyptologists love to show the black community. Here we see Pharaoh Tutankhamen, shown as red, beating up the people from Sudan, shown as black. And then what the Egyptologists will do is they will tell the black community, see these black people being beaten up? That's your people, that is. Does that make sense? And then the Egyptians are presented as some other race. Does that make sense? Do you see how this image becomes something that they can use as propaganda? Get it? Who did I say this was? Who's that? So how comes he's black here and red in the other picture? Yes? Right, so this is the reason why you have to check whether the colors are supposed to be real or whether the colors are supposed to be symbolic. Does that make sense? And just to make sure that no one can't get away from this, there's his mummy. Now, can you see that looks just like a modern Kenyan? That looks just like a modern Tanzanian? Just like a modern Ugandan? Yes? yes. Okay. We're feeling that. Right, this is West African art. This is from West Africa. And we see the people of Dahomey in West Africa shown as red, beating up the Yorubas who are shown as black. Does it mean then that the Dahomey people really were red? Is that what it means? No, it, these are color symbols. Here we see Sudanese art. This is not Egyptian art now. This is Sudanese art. Men are shown which color? Yeah. Women are shown? Yeah. So again, this is proof that the red-yellow thing are color symbols. They are not real. And just to hammer home the point, European art. This is the art from ancient Greece. Men are shown? Women are shown. Does it mean then that ancient Greek men were black? Is that what it means? Well, they're painted black, aren't they? Can you see, clearly, ancient Greek men were not black. These are simply color symbols. Are we understanding this? All right, now we're in the home straight now, coming to the close of this. We're going to talk about our final civilization, and our final civilization is Ethiopia. We need to know where this place is, Aksu and this place here, Lalibela. Ethiopia has thousands and thousands and thousands of years of history. Between 300 BC and 300 AD, the Ethiopians built this. 
And this is an obelisk. And we've got a doorway carved into it, one story worth of windows, two stories worth of windows, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine stories worth of windows. And this means at some point between 300 BC and 300 AD, these guys knew about multi-story buildings. The second thing is, this obelisk weighs, uh, excuse me, 300 tons. 300 tons is the same weight as 450 automobiles. Are we understanding this? Yes? Now, here's the thing. That wasn't the biggest one. This was. This <coughs> used to weigh, oh, so it's now it's since fallen over, this weighs 520 tons, which is the same weight as 700 automobiles. This is the largest sculpted obelisk in the world. Now, it's since fallen over, but you'll understand why nobody can move it. You can't move something like that. So here we have then our sixth fact about African history, the largest fallen obelisk in the world. Now, in the year 330 AD, the Ethiopians became Christians, and they built that monument there to celebrate becoming Christian. It's called the Cathedral of St. Mary of Zion. It's one of the oldest Christian cathedrals on earth. Ethiopians issued coins. So this is another place in Africa that had coins. And the coins have got the faces of the kings showing the faces of 20 early rulers. And these coins were necessary in their trade with places like Egypt, with places like Arabia, with places like India, and even with places like China. Ethiopia is about books, just like West Africa was about books. And there are a quarter of a million old manuscripts written by Africans that have still survived in Ethiopian monasteries and Ethiopian churches. Now, let's take a look. The Daily Telegraph, one of the British newspapers said, manuscript found in Ethiopian monastery could be the world's <coughs> oldest illustrated Christian work. Are we understanding this? World's oldest. So here we've got another fact. Here's our fact number seven. Yes? The world's oldest illustrated Christian works. In other words, illustrated art, decorative art. If it's in a Christian context, it's coming straight from Ethiopia. And if you're not an Ethiopian and you're doing it, you're copying it from an Ethiopian tradition, one way or the other. Now let's look at some Ethiopian art. Now here we see typical art. Everyone is painted the color red. Again, we have to understand, we've seen this in other African civilizations, the red is color symbolism. Does that make sense? But notice that the angels have all got afros and they've all got wings. And then here we see Our Lady. And look at her halo. Red, green, and gold. Yes? Rastafari colors. And then here we have the three saints. Saint Mercurius with his red horse, Saint Theodore with his black horse, and Saint George with his white horse. Yes, that Saint George with his afro. Yes? Or are you feeling this? <laughs> All right, now here we see Emperor Lalibela. Emperor Lalibela, he lived between 1180 and 1220 AD. And the emperor is shown with a kind of 1970s Lionel Richie thing going on. <laughs> and can you see that he's got a pickaxe in his hand? And as he's chiseling away, buildings are appearing. Yes? Yes. He's chiseling away, buildings are appearing. Now, he lived between 1180 and 1220 AD, and that's what is going on. Now, I'll just let that sink in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's on Kenya? Yeah? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, now what this is, this is showing that the Ethiopians carved these two churches out of the ground by hammer and chisel. Are we feeling this? Okay, now can we see that footbridge there? Can you see that footbridge? All right, let me show you that footbridge from a different angle. There it is. 
And all of this now has been carved into the ground to a depth of 11 meters below ground level. Well, let's get a different angle. That's ground wow. level. Here now, we're 11 meters. Can you see that guy here and this guy here? They're both monks. Ethiopia markets this city as the eighth wonder of the world. Okay, let's look at the other church. Now, again, this is ground level. This is 10 meters below ground level. And when we go inside this church, this is what's inside. All of this used to be mountainside, and they carved this out. They carved this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hammer and chisel built between 1180 and 1220 AD. Yes, sir. That's not sand. That's stone. That's stone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes? Oh, yeah. Showing that we used to be about mathematical and engineering precision. All right, final word, Sheikh Antediop. Sheikh Antediop shows that African history proceeded without interruption. The first Nubian dynasties were prolonged by the Egyptian dynasties until the occupation of Egypt by the Indo-Europeans starting in the 5th century BC. Nubia remained the sole source of culture and civilization until about the 6th century AD, and then Ghana seized the torch from the 6th century until 1240, when its capital was destroyed by Sundiata Keita. This heralded the launching of the Mandingo Empire of Mali. Next came the Empire of Gao, Songhai. That's where we began, yes? Yeah, yeah. We began with the Songhai Empire. Um, the kingdoms of Jolof and Kayor, destroyed by Fayd Herb under Napoleon III. In listing this chronology, we wanted to show that there was no interruption in African history. It is evident that if starting from Nubia and Egypt, we had followed a continental geographical direction such as Nubia to the Gulf of Benin, which would have taken us to the Yoruba civilization. Remember the Yoruba civilization? We dealt with that. Nubia to Congo, Nubia to Mozambique, which would have taken us to the Swahili civilization. The course of African history would still have appeared to be uninterrupted. This is the perspective in which the African past should be viewed. So to sum up then what we just said, Africa has Mansa Musa I, the richest man in history. Africa has the great mosque of Jene, the largest clay brick building on earth. Africa has Yoruba metal art, the finest art of the medieval world. Africa has the city of Kilwa. The Tanzanian city was considered one of the most beautiful and well-constructed in the world. Africa has the kingdom of Tar Seti, the world's first kingdom. Africa has the Khufu pyramid, the great pyramid of Giza, establishing Khufu as the greatest architect in history. Africa has the Aksum obelisk, the largest sculpted obelisk in the world. Africa has the world's first illuminated Christian manuscript in the world. And Africa has the eighth wonder of the world. You want to read some more about this? There's a book called When We Ruled. It happened to be written by somebody called Robin Walker. I wonder who the hell that is. And so here in his chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, let me take some questions and then after that we can get into whoever wants to buy this up to say. All right, any, any questions? Well, a lot of information I didn't study. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, y'all go ahead. How many years of research? <laughs> uh, seven years. Seven years. Yeah, seven years. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I heard earlier this is your first time to the States. That's right, yeah. So have you uh, went around the world besides Africa uh, presenting your book? Um, a few places. Jamaica. Yes. Um, Oslo in, uh, what is that, Norway. Um, and in Holland, people in Holland, invite, black community, if they invited me to come out. And in Holland, it was the same, in, in uh, Oslo, it's the same thing. The black community there invited me to come out. Excellent. Question. Uh, yes, sir. You grew up where? In London, mostly. Okay, that's yeah. where you were born and everything. Yeah, I was born in London. Uh, my family are Jamaicans. Uh, I lived for, as a child in Jamaica for a few years and then returned to London. And yeah, I'm in London. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, what sparked your interest in African history and culture? When I found out that uh, I grew up on roots, remember roots? Yeah. Kunta Kinte and all that stuff? When I found out that our history is more than that, and then uh, when I found out the big thing, the big thing is what I'm coming with right now. 
not only does the history exist, I can show it to you. I can show you manuscripts, I can show you the monuments, I can show you the fine art. Does that make sense? When I found that out, that's when uh, I decided to get serious into this thing. How is this uh, grasp, like here in North America, well, amongst African Americans who are interested, we, uh, we do a whole lot of research and study into African history. How is this in Europe, in England, London, where you come from? Is it accepted the way it's accepted here, especially on the east coast of North America? Um, the scene of people who are interested is very, very small. Very, very small. Um, the kind of books, if you look at the kind of books we see here, you'll see them all in London, yeah? Um, the kind of books I started with were people like that guy here, Ben Yochanan. Mm -hmm. right. um, there's a book he did called Africa, Mother of Western Civilization. That was one book. Uh, there's a scholar called Sheikh Anta Diop. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us grew up on, you know, read that kind of thing. But the scene is small. Most black British people are not into this. They're on some sellout foolishness, as, as, as in most cases, most black people are on some Very sellout wise. foolishness. Yeah? So um, there's a small number of us, but we're trying to make a difference and we're trying to get that word uh, out there. All right, well, yes, sir. In what context um, would you like the book to be studied? Um, my thing is this. Um, if you're a parent, you need this book. Does that make sense? If, it's, if you're a teacher, you need this book. If you're an adult, because my thing is, you know, a lot of people say, uh, let's get this to the youth. Who's going to teach those young people? It's going to be us. So if the adults don't get with this, the word is not going to get to the youth. So I want ordinary people to do this. Now, a lot of people will take one look and say, wait a minute, this is so thick. It's quite an easy read. What makes the book, if you like, difficult is there's a lot of it but each paragraph is actually quite simply written. Does that make sense? So my thing is, I want as many people who are interested in learning what their history is. This is probably the best, comp you know, putting it together in one place. This is where the research is at right now. Okay. Uh, on the university and college level, well, as far as like debating and having conversations and arguments with European and Caucasian scholars. Have you been involved in any of that with your research as far as they're saying that what you're saying is not true? Yeah. Um, there was a scholar called, well, there was a scholar um, called uh, Stephen Howe. And he wrote a book called Af uh, Afrocentrism, Mythical Pasts and Imagined Homes. Mythical, in other words, we're making it up. I debated him in 1999, and there's a video of it. And that video, I understand, has actually traveled as far as the United States. So there are, gonna, there are people in the United States who saw it. Now, the fact that it was on video was a bit embarrassing because we destroyed him. Wow. Totally destroyed him, and it's on video. So it's not me saying uh, I destroyed him. Just watch the video. It's, very it's called The Great Debate. The Great Debate. Yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, that was, I think he just dis disappeared after that, uh, and that was that. Yeah? That was easy. That was yeah. an easy win. <laughs> you saw it? No, uh, the information itself. Yeah, uh, yeah, very yeah, familiar yeah. With yeah. A lot of it. Okay, let me do it in this order. One, two, and there's some people over here. Okay, let's do you net and you. Yes, how sir. Long, how long, how long, you, how long did, how long did it take you to um, research the book? Seven years. Okay. I started in 1999, and then the book was out 2006. Seven years. Okay, yes, sir. If we're looking at so many years, yeah. and we're going back, you're going into the 300s. In your studies, Sultan, where are the Europeans coming in? Is there a sense mm. of origin? I mean, where did they kind of sort of come from? Yeah, they came from us. Second okay. King. Yeah, this is what it is. Um, Europeans have got the same DNA as Africans. The difference is, is that we have the widest spread, they have the narrowest spread. And that's why we know that their genes come from our genes. They know this too. Um, they don't store something they, they like to publicize too much, but they know this too. Um, Europeans have been around for, for 20,000 years. And the, the earliest skeletons that are definitely Europeans come from southern France, right? Um, and then from there, they gradually spread out to become the people of Europe. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, they are the descendants of black albinos that existed during the, the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, it's not controversial. I know in this country people pretend that's controversial. How dare you say that? That's just accepted science. That's just where, where it is. Yeah. All right. Now where they fit in is their first civilization is about 700 BC, the ancient Greeks. 700 BC is uh, the very end of Egyptian history. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think that the Egyptians and the Greeks were around at the same time. No, Egypt was over, then we get Greece. So that's the beginnings of their history. Then from Greece they created the Roman civilization, right. which created the Roman Empire. And then when the Roman Empire collapsed, the Europeans went into their Dark Ages. And then when they came out of the Dark Ages, we then get the Renaissance period, 1492, people coming here. Does that make sense? So Europeans have been ruling the world since 1492. But before that, they had Greece and Rome, and before that, they were just not in history, full stop. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else, somebody have a question over here? All right, then. And that's no other questions, then. Thanks for coming out. Wonderful presentation. Yes, sir. Right. Do you have a contact, uh, informa uh, contact uh, website or anything where I could get... Yeah, um, okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you, you, your contact would start here in the Black Classic Press. I know these guys. Let me, you I got know. it. You got it. Yeah, I have got it. That question. <laughs> the video of that debate, do you think you could get your hands on Black Classic that? Press, yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? Do you think you could get your hands on that debate and maybe send it to uh, Black and Nobels? Because we would love to have that, mm -hmm. see that okay. for our community, mm -hmm. because we, we love that kind of work. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I'll yes, see what I can do. But uh, um, I. Th to my knowledge, it's already in the United States somewhere, but we, we, we can hook something up. Thank you, sir. All right, nice one, yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Right off the bar, Mary Substop, Philadelphia, PA. Shot so loud, you would think it was a club spot. African Americans, although we all over the web, we the hood librarians. We ship the prisons too. We reach out and deliver to those that's bitten too. But it's more than a bookstore. You want it, we got it. Mixtapes, DVDs, and culture products. Black and Nobel got our hands in a lot of projects. We walk them on to come build. The energy is positive. And remember, other teams is awake and conscious. Come through and experience this place of knowledge. They say they'll put it in a book if they wanna hide it from us. But we got them books so you can buy it from us. Something to read while you on a train or riding the bus. Get your read on, food for thought, get your eat on. Black and Nobel. I buy my books at Black and Nobel.